Also, auf jeden Fall werde ich noch jemand für das Ja, genau, schauen wir, wie viel DFG du kriegst. No, no, I'm not going to take that at all. No, but I told me and I asked him for a day. Oh, yeah. I'm not like holding him because he's doing a lot of work. Oh, oh. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay.
morning and it's great that the Reverend Philip Gallagher back to take the service. Philip, as usual, we look forward to your message to us this morning. And I also say a word of welcome to those who are joining us from home. We hope that you enjoy your time of fellowship with us as well. As usual, you're all more than welcome to join us for a cup of tea and coffee and further chat in the hall after the service. So please don't be in a hurry away. There's just uh, a few announcements, or quite a few announcements this week. Uh, on Tuesday from 10 until 12, the Knit and Matter will meet in the hall as usual. And then on Tuesday evening, yeah, Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock, the prayer meeting and Bible study will meet upstairs as well. And then on Friday at 7.30, the bowling club will continue in the main hall. Then on Saturday evening, next Saturday evening, in Trinity Methodist Church, at 7.30 there will be an evening of music and praise with Palm Rose and everyone is welcome to go to that. Uh, if anyone is wishing to go, could you please see any of the ladies afterwards, it's just that we make them know of numbers. Uh, so that's next Saturday evening at 7.30, an evening of praise and music with Palm Rose in Trinity. Then next Sunday morning worship will be here as usual at 10.30 and the Reverend Ken Lindsay will be along to take the service next week. Then on Thursday the 28th of March it will be the Navy and Craig Moore AMWA meeting. It will be here in the hall and Charlotte will be along to speak on her recent Gobi Gallup trip. So all ladies will be welcome. That's on Thursday the 28th of March. Then just a reminder that on the 14th of April um, there's going to be an afternoon tea here in the hall. Uh, immediately after church, and everyone is welcome. Feel free to bring a friend or a neighbour or whoever along. And um, it will be in aid of Adopt a Child. And I was saying that last week we do need numbers. There's a sheet in the porch, and if anybody is wishing to come, just to put your name down, please, so that we have a rough idea of numbers. And anyone that would like more details on that, to contact Deborah. Finally, uh, can we just as a congregation, wish Joshua all the best tomorrow. Uh, Joshua is taking part in the school's cup final for Balamina Academy, and they will be playing against Inst. It's a big, it's a big day. It's a big achievement for Joshua, and we wish you all the best. Your dad said he would fill in if there was any problems, <laughs> but we wish you every success, Joshua, tomorrow. So these are all the announcements you may remember them. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here and um, to, to worship um, God together. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn, All Glory, Lord and Honour. <coughs>
Let's unite our hearts in prayer. All glory, Lord, and honour to Thee, our Redeemer, King. Lord, what a privilege it is to be here this morning, to contemplate and behold together You, the King of Kings, the, the Lord of Lords, coming to us as a Saviour King, not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for all. Or that that depth of your love is more than we can fathom. We give you all praise, adoration, and worship. Bow together in your, your holy presence. We're mindful that at many times, in many ways, we have fallen short of your glory. We have missed the mark. We confess our sins to you, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, knowing that as we confessed, we are, we are washed clean. That a new song of, of praise and worship is, is put in our hearts. That you, you lift us up, you free us to, to go forward. Unhindered by all that is in our past to serve you and to, uh, to shine for you and the opportunities you continually have for us, you continually present us with. Lord, as we worship you this morning, we ask that, that you would meet with us in a new and fresh way. We ask that you would speak to us, that by your grace and by your spirit you would be at work within us, opening our hearts to respond to you, to submit to you, to yield to you, to place all that we have and are in, in your hands. That as we worship we would be brought closer to you, that our lives would be filled with the joy, peace and freedom you have to give. Through your worship be exalted, and may your name be magnified. Now we join our prayers together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We now receive our offering for God's work. <coughs> Let's stand and sing together in Christ alone. 
Hello, my deepest friend. He is my light, my strength, my soul. as if 
they were yours. Through your faith in you, we, we bow before you now. To pour out to you all that is on our heart, to make our petitions known to you. Lord, I thank you for this church here in this place. I thank you for the warmth, the the love and, and the fellowship, the, the, the kindness uh, given to one another and, and beyond. We pray that you would continue to, to bless our times of worship together and all the activities that, that we are involved in, that in everything we, we do, that, that your love would be shared, that you would be made known, and that you would continue to show us the, the doors you would have us to, to walk through, the opportunities you have for each of us in, in, our, in our daily lives to, to bear witness about you. By your Spirit, continue to give us boldness to take those. Lord, we pray for the, the Methodist Church in Ireland at this time as its annual uh, conference approaches. Lord, we pray for its uh, leadership. Lord, we, we thank you for them and we, we pray that you would uh, continue to, to lead them in, in the path of, of faithfulness. That in all decisions to be made, Lord, that your will will be sought. And, and, and the desire that would overrule all else is the desire to be faithful and obedient to you. Continue to lead our church forward throughout this land uh, to make you know. And Lord, we, 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 we lift our, our, our government here before you. We pray for your your hand upon Stormont, that you would help them, Lord, with the, the difficult decisions that they have to make, that you would give them um, courage, selflessness, and, and, and wisdom in all that they do. Lord, we think of places in the world where there is conflict. We lift before you all that is happening in in Israel and Palestine. We pray for a just and fair settlement, for an end to, to violence and, and, and needless loss of life and suffering. We just pray for peace, freedom, and justice for all. That the through your, your church, your, your people in that land, Lord, that everyone around them would just see your love and be touched and changed by it. And Lord, for other places in the world where there is conflict, in places like Yemen and, uh, and Ukraine, Lord, we, we, we do indeed pray for peace. We pray for leaders in those lands and, and world leaders who have influence on the events happening in them. Lord, to, to work uh, together for, for the good of those who are suffering. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning, worshipping, praising and adoring you. For this opportunity to gather as a people and to hear from you. We pray that by your spirit you would speak to us and draw us closer to yourself. In Jesus' name. Amen. We turn now to God's word. This morning we are reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a coat the foal of a donkey. 
The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. We thank God for his word to us. Let's stand and sing, Right on, right on, in majesty.
It's even more impossible to get your head around. Like a parent with a child, because of his great love for us, Jesus chooses to make himself need the things we have, so that we might know the eternal joy, reward and delight that comes from everything we possess and are being in his hands for his use. What I have, my puny little donkey of a gift, could be of no use to the Saviour we all think from time to time. Because of his great immeasurable love for us, it is of great use and great value to him. As we look at this well-known story of our Saviour King coming into Jerusalem to accomplish our redemption that was planned in the heart of God from eternity past, we will see what his coming on a donkey means for us and how we must respond to him. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem in the back of a donkey reveals that he is the long-awaited son of David who would accomplish everlasting deliverance and peace for all of God's people. Through the Gospel of Matthew, throughout, the, a phrase like the one we have here in verse 4 occurs repeatedly. This took place to fulfil what was spoken by the prophet. Jesus himself tells us in, in chapter 5 of this Gospel that he came to fulfil the law and the prophets to accomplish the salvation foretold in them. Matthew is showing us continually in this Gospel and in, in this passage that Jesus didn't appear out of thin air. Everything that happened to him and everything he said and did was according to God's eternal plan for our salvation foretold in his word. Jesus entrusted himself to the word of his Father in which our salvation was foretold. He was ready and willing to obey it to the point of death, even death on the cross because he knew that his father's way was the best way for him and for us. At any point, Jesus could have had all the, the, the wealth, adulation and fame this world had to offer. But in faith, he, he reckoned that the father's reward to be greater than anything this world could give. And we'd only be truly happy when we do the same. The preparation for Jesus' final entrance into Jerusalem is perfectly ordained and planned by God, so the scriptures will be fulfilled. The two disciples find things just as Jesus said they would, and they bring the, the donkey and her coat to him. Verse 4 and 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king coming to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the coat, the, the foal of a donkey. The Jewish crowd watching would have known immediately that by entering Jerusalem in this way, Jesus was declaring himself to be the one Zechariah spoke about. Matthew is quoting here from, from a book in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. Words spoken 500 years before the birth of Jesus. This is what Zechariah said at that time. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Jesus, by fulfilling this prophecy, is, is saying in a clear and obvious way, I am the divine sea of your king, whose rule will extend from sea to sea, in whom alone all the inhabitants of the earth can find everlasting life, salvation and peace. <coughs> The King Jesus is showing himself to be as a humble, gentle, tender, 
king, who in love came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for all, as a ransom for each and every one of us. As Matthew said earlier in this gospel, a bruised reed he will not break, a faintly burning wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory and in his name the Gentiles will hope. In Jesus there is eternal life, salvation and peace for every one of us. We have nothing to fear, no reason to hold back from coming to him. No matter how bruised and damaged you are by the trials and afflictions of life, no matter how faint your flame and vigour may have become due to failure, disappointments and entanglements you can't free yourself from, Jesus will not break you. Jesus will not extinguish you. He will forgive, cleanse and renew you. That's what is coming into Jerusalem humbled and mounted on a donkey means. That's what he meant when he said, I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Zechariah, who prophesied that, that Jesus would come down in the Mount of Olives in this way, also spoke of another time when he would descend on the same mountain. In chapter 14 of his book, Zechariah tells us that Jesus will stand upon the Mount of Olives once more, and on that occasion the mountain will be split in two. He will execute judgment against all who rejected him and establish his kingdom on earth in its fullness. In Revelation 19, this truth is further enforced. There we are told that Jesus will come again, not humbled and mounted on a donkey, but on a white horse with eyes like flames of fire, with a sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, with which he will execute judgment. What these prophecies make clear to us is that the window of salvation will not always be open. His invitation on which he says, a bruised reed I will not break, a faintly burning wick I will not put out. This invitation will not last forever. Now is the time of salvation. Now is the time for you to come to him and be received by him with open arms as he longs to do. When I look back at the time before I knew Jesus Christ, what I had my greatest guilt and shame over was not the the, the filthy language that came out of my mouth was vulgar as that was. It wasn't my reckless, drunken behaviour or, or the, the lies that I, I told day after day as, as immoral as those were. What I felt most ashamed about, the, the, the reason I was convinced that Jesus Christ could never accept me, was because I had said no to his invitation too many times. Out of my desire to remain in control, the, the, the boss of my own life, I refused to believe in him, even though I knew for sure that he personally died for me. Some of you here this morning may have been saying no to Jesus over many years for the same reason. Perhaps you think it's too late for you, that you've rejected him one too many times. The fact that he came humbled and mounted on a donkey as a servant king to give his life for all, and that he has not yet returned upon the Mount of Olives. This tells you that the window is still open for you. This promise still stands for you. A bruised reed I will not break, a faintly burning wick I will not put out. Now is the time of salvation for you. No matter what you think and feel, in this moment Jesus is inviting you. His invitation remains personally open to you to put your trust in him. Jesus coming to Jerusalem humbled and mounted on a donkey tells us he is the divine King and Saviour 
God promised for all mankind whose peace and rule will extend to the ends of the earth. It tells us he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for, for all of us. And that now is a time of salvation. As this window of opportunity remains open only for a short time. How must we respond to the servant king? Two options are presented to us in this passage. We can respond as the crowd did in verse 8 and 9, or as Jesus foretold the owner of the donkey would in verse 3. The crowd's response to Jesus appears to be the right one. They are acknowledging and worshipping him as God's chosen see of your king by, by exclaiming, exclaiming Hosanna to the son of David and by, by, by casting their, their garments and, and branches before him. But their commitment to Jesus is only a superficial surface commitment. They remain loyal to him only as long as they think that doing so will, will result in everything going well for them in, in this world. As soon as they realise he will not deliver them immediately from Roman occupation. And that following him doesn't guarantee career success, wealth, physical health, military victory. As soon as they realise this, which is three days later when Jesus is on the cross, this same crowd shouts, crucify him, crucify him. The response of the owner of the donkey is, is different. As soon as he hears the words, the Lord has need of it. He doesn't hesitate or bargain. Rather, he, he sends it immediately. He places what he has in Jesus' hands, recognizing that he is the divine Savior King that Scripture promised. He was entering to Jerusalem to accomplish redemption for the entire world. Why would the Lord need someone's donkey? Why would he need our small gifts, talents, resources? Given that he holds all creation together by the power of his word, that all the treasures of heaven are his. He chooses to need them. Because in his love for us, he wants us to know the true joy, freedom and peace that comes from all that we have and are being in his hands for his use. In my walk with Jesus, I find that when I've tried to bargain with God, but what I keep for myself and what I give to him, it's only led to dissatisfaction and robbed me of joy. The Christian life is not about continually struggling with guilt and uncertainty over whether I'm letting God down by enjoying this hobby or, or spending time pursuing that interest. God doesn't want us to, to live in that big way. We drain ourselves dry by doing so and, 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 and find no lasting victory. Rather, he wants us to ask in, in freedom and joy as those who are completely his. Lord, you've given me these interests, these passions, and these pursuits. How can I give them back to you? How can I give you my love of cars, sports, drama, fashion, music, socialising with people, and whatever else I'm interested in? How can, how can I enjoy you in all these good things and share your love and good news through them with, with, with those that give me opportunity to meet and spend time with? In our church activities from knitting to bowling to hospitality to music to, to sound and AV to, to making newsletters and, and so forth. And many other things. You've placed your, your passions, your, your interest in God's hands to be used by him to, to share his love. How can I do that with every hobby and interest I have, with every talent and possession God has entrusted me with? 
You might think it's small and insignificant. That is a puny little donkey. But God has need of it because of his great love for you. In that love, he wants for you what the man he handed over his donkey without hesitation had, which is the, the, the joy, freedom, and peace that comes from him being Lord, Master, and purpose of everything you possess and are. An early 20th century missionary by the name of Betty Stan, who was martyred for her faith in China, inspiring a generation of missionaries to follow her. She said this about her commitment of her entire life to Jesus. When we consecrate ourselves to God, we think we are making a great sacrifice and doing lots for him. When really, really, we're only letting go of some little bitsy trinkets we've been grabbing. And when our hands are empty, he fills them full of his treasures. The only right response to Jesus, the servant king, he rode into Jerusalem humbled and mounted on a donkey, is to place all we have in his hands and say to him, how can I enjoy you in this and share you through it? Because of his love for it, he has need of it. Out of his love for us, he wants us to know the eternal joy and reward that comes from placing our tiny, itsy bitsy, earthly trinkets in his hands to be used by him. We know in our heads that what our Saviour has in store for us is much greater than what we possess in this world. But it's still hard to place what we have in his hands. We all struggle and, 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 and wrestle when it comes to responding willingly to the invitation. The Lord has need of it. There's a children's talk I've done in a few different places. I should have brought up today, apologies. In, in which I give each child a jelly baby. I ask him to feel it, to smell it, to lick it. Then I say, right, the moment you've been waiting for, give it back to me. <laughs> if they comply, they get a big tag bag of jelly beans. If they don't, they learn a valuable lesson. For most of them, handing the sweet back isn't easy. They squirm in their seats, they, they protest, they try to, to run away or to put it up their sleeves. As serious and intense as our struggle is for us, that's how ridiculous we look to God. When we are trying to keep some of our interests, passions and, and possessions for ourselves, we're squirming in our seats over a tiny little jelly baby. And the full treasure of heaven is on offer to you. <laughs> the only way we overcome this struggle is by faith. Faith is living by the belief and conviction that the big bag of sweets, the eternal treasure we don't see, is infinitely greater than the, the single sweet the little earthly trinket we have in our hand. Only by faith can we respond to Jesus, the King of glory, as we must, with wholehearted adoration and the commitment he is due. Only by faith can we know the true joy and freedom that comes from placing our lives, all we have and are, in his hands for his use. He came not to burden us. He needs what we have not to burden us, but, but, but in love to, to free us. That we might find fullness of joy in him. Humbled and mounted on a donkey, he says to you, a bruised reed I will not break. 
A faintly burning wick I will not put out. I have need of what you have. While his invitation remains open, put your trust in him. For the joy set before you, commit all you have and are into his hands. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. He will not turn you away. The window remains open for all. Come to him, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, as you are. Put your trust in him. He will receive you. He will make you his. He will take all you have and are and use it to share your love in this world. He will fill you with eternal joy and peace that will last forevermore. We thank God for his word to us this morning. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, When I Survey the Wonders <coughs> Cross.
We thank you that no matter how small it is in our eyes, because of your great love for us, we have need of it. But as we place ourselves in your care, in your trust, to, to walk with you, to be your vessel, you will use us in ways greater than we can comprehend to share your love and good news in this world. Lead us forth, filled with your spirit, to shine for you, to be channels of your grace to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.